Uh, so we get visitors from all over the world. So Kai has, has come here um, to, to visit Taunas, but also to visit uh, Schumacher College and Satish Kumar. And, and uh, some of us have been lucky enough to go to Japan also and share some of the things that we're doing there. So it's really nice to be part of, um, of uh, an international network of people who are, who are doing these things. Kai Sawyer uh, has been uh, an activist in the permaculture movement now for many, many years. He founded the Tokyo Urban Permaculture Guild in Tokyo. He founded the Peace and Permaculture Dojo in Isumi. Isumi is a, is a rural um, collection of small towns, not unlike Devon in many ways. And uh, he's been a follower of Gandhian uh, principles in his activism. Uh, he's uh, a really, really fantastic guy, and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce to you now Kai Sawyer. So please, cool. Kai, come up and let's give him a warm. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump into it. So um, I'll just kind of briefly give you kind of my journey because I think everything is important to put into context and why I'm in Japan really kind of starts with, um, well, first of all, I'm half Japanese, half American, born in Tokyo, lived in rural Japan, Hawaii, and then back to Osaka, Japan, which is a bigger city, and then went to California for college. And that was really my first time to leave Japan and sort of experience America um, in my, on my own. And I went to UC Santa Cruz, which is in the Redwood Forest, and really a hub of alternative, uh, lots of activists, feminists, there's demonstrations all the time. It was just kind of an interesting place to be um, as a Japanese who's never really done anything um, so kind of against the rules because it's just not what you do in Japan. Generally you follow the rules, but Santa Cruz was like the weirder you can be, the more kind of interesting you were and, and the more radical you can be, kind of that was the more just kind of exciting life could be. So that was the kind of weird environment that I ended up with. And then um, uh, and they have a lot of organic farming, but so, sorry. <laughs> um, so right when I started college, this is 9-11 happened. That was kind of like my welcome to America was 9-11. Then the war happened. And Japan has a very peace loving culture because of the tragedies of war. Um, we have a constitution that pre prevents us from having an active military. Um, we, we do have a self-defense force, which is pretty much a military, but we're not allowed to fight in foreign wars. Um, but that all changed after 9-11 um, and with US pressure. For the first time, Japanese sent soldiers to uh, Iraq, which is totally out of context. Um, and it was also kind of coming to grips with the reality where I thought generally more or less war has ended after World War II, we're in a peaceful world and you know life is, is kind of good for most people but, but to be in a country that's actually saying we're going to war and we're going to go bomb people because they might attack us, which is the really bizarre reality um, that I jumped into, um, was kind of a challenging thing and to be in, sitting in a college trying to learn about macroeconomics, which just had nothing to do with anything that my reality was projecting into my life. And so, um, one of the biggest moments that shifted my life was there was a walkout in college. And this was, I think, on the day that they were gonna um, attack Iraq or Afghanistan first. So yeah, Afghanistan. And suddenly students got out of their chairs, you know, like if this was a lecture hall, students just suddenly got up at a certain time and walked out. And to me that blew my mind because as a Japanese student, you're supposed to sit in your chair and listen to the teacher and get the grades because that's your job, you know, that's your job as a student. And suddenly to see these students just my same age walk out was just really moving to me. And it was kind of like an invitation, it's like, are you going to sit there and just watch this all happen? Or are you going to get up and go on an adventure? And so I, I stood up and I walked with the students and we ended up shutting down the university. And you know, this is like 
all happened in a second, so I didn't know I was going to shut down the university, but <laughs> suddenly I'm with a group of 400 students, and we effectively blocked the two paths into the university. Community members, even professors came in and shut down the university. This became national news. Um, and so that was really kind of my entrance into the world of alter the alternative world. Um, and from there, everything has changed. So, and kind of jumping forward, I moved to the jungle in Costa Rica. Um, quite a jump, but I was teaching about sustainability. I was doing peace work in college, but I just felt like it was like just a lot of talking and a lot of ideas, but my life wasn't embodying you know, really what I valued. And so I wanted to just experience life in a different way. And so I, I had an opportunity to move to the jungle in Costa Rica and I lived really simply, chopping wood, carrying water, eating bananas, mangoes, and coconuts, which were all free. I mean, and that blew my mind. It's like free mangoes, bananas, and coconuts every day. And those are my, my favorite fruits. So I eat like 20 or 30 bananas a day. You know, and that's like no work. It's not even, I'm not planting a seed, I'm not growing anything. I'm just like, go to the banana tree, grab some bananas. Go to the mango tree, pick up some mangoes. And, and for me, this really challenged my paradigm because in Japan we have this phrase, which is, if you don't have money, you can't eat. And it's a mantra. We, we, we actually chant this on a daily basis in the cities. You know? We don't have enough money. We don't have enough time. You can't eat without money. You know, and, and so people chant this so that it becomes a reality. But then I was in the jungle and there was no place to use money. In fact, only the, the only creature that wanted the money was mold. So I was growing mold on the money, but there was no other creature that would accept money because it's useless in the ecological world. So it was just kind of like a bizarre, like, okay, so then what's the point of money, you know, in this context? So the context very much challenged my perspective on the world. So this is the hut that I lived in. That's my just two uh, cinder blocks, and then I just made a fire, and uh, I almost burnt the top of the house actually once. But, um, you know, I was just experimenting, learning how to live, and I had never done any of this. It took me three hours to start my first fire, you know, and it was really challenging, but it really started to help me understand what the earth was. It was kind of like the first time I met the earth. My neighbors, the howler monkeys. So I met more monkeys than people on a daily basis. And we would actually have interactions because if they were in the mango tree, they didn't want me coming near. and They would throw pee at me if I came close. So it's kind of like, okay. Okay, that's pretty hostile, but you can have the mangoes and then I'll wait. And when they left, I would go pick the mangoes. And so it's kind of like, you know, working with the neighbors you don't like, you know. And when they're out and shouting, then you just kind of like stand back and let them do their thing. And when they're gone, you go. And so this for me also challenged and changed my concept of what community is. So usually community, I used to think of just people I like. And then slowly I started to say, well, people you don't like are also part of the community. And then to further expand that to, well, what about other creatures? Because we all share this planet Earth. And so whether it's a cockroach or a rat, we're all just trying to live. And so how do you develop beneficial relationships, even with the, the creatures or the people that you don't like? And so this was kind of like another uh, really deep insight. And also kind of this, this I later found out, but I really like this idea of, you know, how we live in this ego system where it's always about the strong leader and we're all trying to either be the strong leader or associate to the strong leader for survival, this kind of pyramid scheme, and shifting to the ecosystem where it's like nobody's above or below. It's just very, you know, like if we die, the microorganisms eat us, you know, and they're like the lowest, but then they're the ones eating us. And so it's really, you know, nobody's killing each other. It's just the cycle of life. And that's what we're a part of. And so this has been a very powerful concept for activism and also trying to understand Japanese culture because I think this is very heavily embedded in the traditional Japanese culture of like life is just transitioning all the time. And for those of you who have lived in Japan, I mean Japan has all the natural disasters all the time. We have earthquakes all the time, we have mudslides, we have typhoons, you know, it's like you just don't know when you're going to die. 
And to be in an environment where per impermanence is a constant reminder is kind of like, okay, so then what do you do in this moment because you're alive now, you might not be alive tomorrow. And so for me, it's really treasuring each moment of life, being trying to be in service as best as possible, and also recognizing that even if I die, it's not such a big deal because it's just part of life, is, is being alive and being dead. Um, and so for me, this how do I be more integrated into this idea of the ecosystem and just be in service while I'm in the ecosystem and everybody supports each other, just like the mango tree was feeding me. Um, so from there, I got really into permaculture. I read Bill Mollison's, like, I don't know, huge 600-page black um, designer's manual. And I was like, permaculture, this is like, how do, how do we not know about this? You know, this is like how to live on Earth 101. And I just was totally inspired, and so I went to this other farm, the Bullock's Permaculture Homestead in the U.S. to learn further about permaculture and about how to design sustainable living systems. Um, this is kind of the house that I lived in, very simple. Um, and it was just fun, you know, like just hanging out with people, growing food, and building culture. And just coming around the fire and one person will bring some food, one person will bring some music and it was just like such a beautiful example of the gift economy where just a few people having fun can attract more people and each person giving their gift makes like a really wonderful cultural community experience. And so this is kind of like a weekly thing and it really was like, why don't we do, why don't we always have this everywhere? And I was like, I have the answer. This is it. Everybody needs to do permaculture. And I was so excited. I was like, I got the answer. And then Fukushima happened. And this was an earthquake, a huge earthquake, and then set off huge tsunamis, um, which was a disaster, a really um, devastating disaster in itself. But it also wiped out a nuclear reactor. Um, and... And so this has been a big theme in my life. And so just how 9-11 happened and the wars happened impacted me. This has been a major transition point for me and a lot of people in Japan. Um, it's kind of like soul searching, like what do we do on this planet when these huge things happen that are out of our control? And we're gonna live with this for at least a couple hundred years. Um, and so it's been a very interesting challenge to have this, but I, I was living in this beautiful permaculture environment, just like, oh, paradise, everybody should do this. And Fukushima actually is a really amazing prefecture that has lots of natural farming, organic farming. It's one of the most beautiful agricultural regions. So it kind of started to make me think more about the local global or local national context. So you can make all these cool farms, but if a giant incinerator is built, then, you know, it's totally jeopardizes everything that's beautiful in the local context. So for me, it's like, okay, what am I going to do? This was like another like invitation to challenge myself and be like, okay, you found your paradise. What are you going to do in this situation? So now I went to Tokyo and it's like, ha, work with this, you know, and can you, I mean, this is a, probably a former swamp and the only green thing that little hedge, you know. But to grow up and live in this environment, it's like, well, who cares about nature? You know, it's just a little hedge in the middle of the road. So the feedback you get is just, everything costs money, you need to make money and consume. So it really changes the reality you see. Um, and so I just started small, I started to do little workshops. I talked about my life in the jungle and permaculture and I taught, I teach nonviolent communication um, and mindfulness. Um, and this for me is like cultivating the soil because in natural farming and organic farming You're not growing the plants you're growing the soil because when the soil is healthy Beauty just unfolds and I think that's the same with community or same with our hearts It's like when our hearts are really fulfilled and happy then beauty unfolds and it's not like we don't even have to try It's just it just keeps flowing out and so for me It's like if we have bad soil it's if everybody's stressed out, short on money, you know, running around and stressed out about Fukushima and climate change, it's really hard to have the beautiful parts of ourselves and the community unfold. So I just was starting to experiment with how do we nourish people because so, so many of us are traumatized and stressed out and it's hard to squeeze more out of ourselves when, you know, daily life is already trouble. And particularly in Tokyo, I can really feel that. 
and, and also experimenting with a gift culture. So I didn't want to do a business. I just wanted to kind of be part of, you know, giving as much as I could and see how far I could go. And, and Tokyo is not a cheap place to live, but I was just like, I just got to experiment. So just like today, I just started to do workshops and talks and I said, support me if you want to and support me in any way you want. And that's, I, I just want to see how far I can go with that. And I'm here today because thousands of people in Japan have supported me and allowed me to live. And so I have no boss. I'm basically employed by people like you who come to these workshops. And it's, it's really touching to know that my life is supported by many people who heard my story and was like, yeah, why don't you, why don't you keep doing that? Here's some energy for that. And kind of through that process, we made a book called The Urban Permaculture Guide. And, and I just wanted to make a book, but I told people, much like in a workshop like this, I said, hey, I want to make a book, but I don't want to write it because I hate writing in Japanese. <laughs> and I just kept saying that. And then I got a group of 30 people who were like, we want to make your book. And we like the gift economy, you know? And so they, they made this book and I thought, you know, it would just be a few notes and I would photocopy a black and white zine, you know, of 20 pages. But they made a beautiful colored book that's almost 200 pages on, you know, various things from permaculture to mindfulness to gift economy. And so this was just a cultural experiment to see, you know, could I be totally irresponsible and just say, I want a book, but I don't want to put much effort into it and see what happens. And so now we have a book and one more. And you know, if it was just a photocopy thing, then I could do it out of pocket. But this is really expensive to print. And I was like, I don't know, guys, this is like an art piece. Maybe it's just one of a kind and we won't make a book out of it. Um, but we crowdfunded, which was my first experiment. And we got 17,000 pounds, basically. And, and more, more important than that was we had 371 people support this. 30 people raised their hands to make the book. So this was like a 400 person book project. And that for me was really touching. It's like, you know, the contents I kind of um, helped direct, but basically 400 people were like, we really want to make this book because it's exciting in some way. And so for me, that gave me a little more of a boost of like, let's do more, you know, let's see how far we can take this. And we also made, after that, somebody said, we want to make a whole earth catalog children's book version of the Urban Permaculture Guide. Yes. So this is, this is that book. Um, this is a compost mandala that my friend drew. So there's compost in the middle. And these are all microorganisms that she looked up in the order that they break down the food. And at the very end, they turn into vegetables. And this is a children's book. And, and I also like edgy things. So I, I encourage people, uh, children to, uh, uh, when the parents aren't looking, to find a bush to pee in, uh, to do gorilla seed planting. So plant seeds where they're not supposed to. And you know, it's just kind of like, we gotta break the rules a little bit or nothing's gonna change because rules are designed to make change not happen. And so we gotta start young. So it's a children's book um, by kind of encouraging them. It's kind of the same things of mindfulness and thinking about what is money and what is life about and making pizza ovens. So if you're interested, you can check them out later. Um, and then I got a rooftop. Somebody was like, you wanna use this? And this is a cheaply made building this is the roof, the metal metal sheet. If you stamp on it, the person below you can hear. And this is just like foam on the top as insulation that the holes were me stepping in them. Um, <laughs> and so somebody offered this. And for permaculture, it's all about you know like okay, what do you how do you how do you make beauty unfold on this this uh, piece of property? And so. We got a bunch of people and I kept telling them this is going to be a community garden and, and a whole bunch of people um, helped out. We got a bunch of, this is all wood that would have been thrown away and we got flooring and we put fencing. The fencing actually is, is not, it's just ornamental and if you push on it, the whole thing falls down. So I don't know why we put it up, but I guess it makes people feel safe. Um, <laughs> But you know, for people in Tokyo, they would never experience such an edgy space. To climb on top of a rooftop with fences that if you push would fall to their death. Um, and do yoga on top and, and grow food. And so this is kind of inviting people to their edge and saying, hey, you know, there's an adventure out there. There's a different way of being. And we can do it in the heart of Tokyo. And if you look, 
um, on to the far left, I mean, this is the cent center of fashion in Tokyo. So it's really amazing to have such a radical experiment in such a central location. And moving on, I, I, I started to think like we need to do something that really, for me, it's like really building peace infrastructure. So it's easy to do events, it's easy to do festivals. I mean, it, put, it, it takes a lot of work. But I, but when we, when I think about it, like our schools are training young people five days a week for many, many years to become consumers and corporate laborers. And I'm like, God, I can't do enough workshops to change that tide. And for me, it's really now about building peace infrastructure. So how do we build a system that continuously allows people to train, to look deeply into some of the issues we're facing in the world? And so we started this in a rural area called the Peace and Permaculture Dojo, and it's really mainly about training youth in how to live, because so many of them know how to use computers, smartphones, you know, move money, but they don't know how to build their houses. They don't know how to grow their food, and so it's always a fear of, if I don't have money, I'm gonna die because you can't, you can't eat without money. And so this is like a kind of my new experiment to try to shift that. And so it's 2.2 uh, acres. This kind of stuff is all over Japan. There's tons of abandoned thatch roof houses with farmland, rice paddies, bamboo forests, everything. They're all there. There's whole villages abandoned. So the infrastructure is all there. There's just no people. And this is to me, it's like, wow, what a gold. Well, a pile of treasure that you know nobody wants to look at because everybody's moving to Tokyo. Bamboo forest. We have a well. This is how it looked when we first came in. It looks like you know the family just ran out of the house. Yeah, so we just pulled out all the trash and then we burnt it. And this is the vision. It's like how do we create a new vision of an old tradition? And so not completely westernizing and just doing the permaculture stuff that's popular in the West, but really connecting to Japanese culture, but making it appealing to the Japanese current population who have grown in a mostly westernized world. Um, and so we have a little Shinto shrine that's always been there, so we always start with a prayer. This is what it looks like. It's actually a thatched roof with a metal sheet. Uh, where is West. This is in Chiba Prefecture, which is where the airport in Disneyland, anything that doesn't fit in Tokyo goes to Chiba. It's kind of like New Jersey of New York. I don't know what the uh, London uh, equivalent would be. Um, um, but yeah, in Isumi, which is a mainly rice paddy area. And we took out all the floors because it was rotting. And this is, uh, so rice husks are uh, abundant in Japan and we usually burn them, but this is making charcoal out of rice husks putting it in the floor as uh, both ionizing, um, so it cleans the air, cleans your body, um, and also really amazing insulation. Because Japanese traditional homes are super cold, um, which makes them unappealing. So most people will just destroy these houses that are 100 to 200 years old because it's just not comfortable to live in, um, which is such a shame. And so we're just kind of experimenting with how do we make it more habitable? Beautiful new floors compost toilets, fixing the shoji, this is like traditional doors that we put rice uh, paper. And these are, last year we had the first experiment to have nine interns live in this pretty uh, minimal situation. And so one person lived in a tent, and we have bamboo shoots everywhere that just poke through the walls. If it went, you know, if it was a little closer, it would have went through the tent. Um, this guy just built a house out of the trash that was lying around, so it was his first time actually building a house. But uh, just think about, you know, the, the, how much more possibility you would feel if you knew you could just build a house out of stuff lying around. Rocket stoves, so they cooked everything with rocket stoves. This is the first time. All of them use gas or electricity, and for the first time they need to collect wood, and you know, cook with fire, which takes a lot more time and skill, but they all learned it, including, she was seven when she came, she was five when she came. They're really amazing fire masters. And this is rice farming. Um, now it's mainly tractor farming, but since you know we're young and we're kind of like free-spirited, it's just kind of like play and working. Some people say plurking. 
you know, she was, so that's, yeah, these are all just them having fun, but rice farming. And so this is really interesting. This is um, uh, a new uh, kind of something that's really getting popular in Japan for ecological restoration. It's all about digging holes kind of sideways and vertically to allow for air and water to move. And basically by encouraging the microbial population in the soil, the wood lasts longer and everything above the soil starts to grow better. Um, and it's kind of like thinking about more water and air go through the soil than above the surface. And since we started to dam up using roads and foundations, it's kind of like you're blocking your blood vessels. And so we have this Daichi no Saisei Earth Restoration, which is all about trying to create more air movement so that the microbial life can flourish and then all the plants will grow more healthier and the houses that traditionally lasted hundreds of years are now rotting but through this we're hoping that it will start to uh, last longer. So this is just them working. Uh, we do some natural plant dyes and then this is uh, doing mud walls and the mud walls are really amazing because everything just comes out of the rice paddy straw, the mud, and then you just put it on. And this is probably mud walls from a hundred years ago. And so we just, some of the areas were spotty, so you just take it off, put some water on, and put it back on. It's like, you know, that's crazy to me. It's like everything biodegrades and it's just from, you know, the local area. Uh, we do theater work. This is a traditional dance, which you dance in a circle called Bomodori, and it's, it's no longer done because it's not hip. So we have some of the young people kind of like uh, remixing it a little bit, but still keeping the traditional flavor and, and having practice sessions where we wear traditional clothes, um, which is also like cultural regeneration. And we have monastics from Plum Village. I'm, I'm pretty connected with these uh, Zen uh, monastics in Plum Village, France, and so they came to do a meditation with us, and this is our kind of child-friendly meditation group with ukulele singing. <laughs> and we have musicians come, drummers, this is my wife, hula dancing, so it's all, it's, you know, multicultural, but it's, it's really a place to express culture and um, have fun, and then we do lots of circles. And we have amazing food and events. These are that was completely vegan and macrobiotic. And this is curry and bamboo plates that we just made, which is pretty fun. Um, and this is the family, you know, meal time. And so, you know, all these young people who've never probably had meals like this unless it was like going out drinking, to have this as a regular practice and understand what it's like to be in community. Um, and the sunsets. It's all rice paddies around this uh, property, so the sunsets are just gorgeous. Um, and then maybe we just do the video really quick. Do any of you want to come? Yeah. And it's really cool for me to be both, you know, in England and Cottonist, which has sort of the old, old buildings and the traditions still intact, and see the differences and similarities in Japan. So Mio, um, she grew up in Tokyo. She was one of the first interns last year. Um, super urban, um, but really kind of shifted her diet to being a vegan rapper. And so she's, she's vegan, but she's trying to make it cool. Um, and so this is a short video, three minutes, about kind of her life. This is the first house that she built, which is quite useless, actually. Um, <laughs> But, but it's cool that she built it. Um, and so we're still trying to figure out what to do with it because nobody wants to live in it anymore. So it's just taking up a lot of space. But, you know, but this is also kind of important for me. It's like the Peace and Permaculture Dojo, the, the idea is not to make this perfect utopia, but to create opportunities for young people to experiment, to make mistakes, and to learn. And I think those spaces are very endangered in the world. And so people can't make mistakes. They have to get the numbers right. They have to get results. And it puts like this unnecessary pressure for new creativity and innovation. So Peace and Permaculture Dojo is very much a place 
for them to experiment and make lots of mistakes and it's okay because we're not aiming for anything more than a lot of learning to happen. <laughs> so that the speaker's only on the computer but basically when she talks the subtitles are coming out so you gotta kind of read the subtitles to get the context. She's a brown rice fanatic. children and you know it's like there was no washing machine at the time so and they had uh, cloth diapers so you have two 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 kids you know with cloth diapers it's like your whole day and then it takes 60 minutes to cook rice and you do that three times a day that's like three hours and so everything takes a lot more time and when you're not used to it because everything is so quick in our modern world it's, it's quite a shift you know particularly for these people but they really kind of got into it. And, and one of the practices that we're trying to really integrate into our lives is miso making. And, and miso has become sort of this powder now, you know, where you just have instant miso soup and it's so amazing. But this is a really deep cultural, spiritual food for us. And the whole process is, you know, you have the koji, which is the mold that grows on the rice. And you harvest the koji, you mix it with soybean, 
Um, and you, you want to mix it with lots of people because you want their micro, like, your, you want their biomes. Like, each of us have our own kind of, uh, kind of collection of microorganisms. And, and the more of that goes into it, the tastier it becomes, is what they say. And so, you know, it's a very wonderful community practice to all, like, be kind of mixing the ingredients. It's very fun. And then also have a beautiful soup um, while you're having it from the miso last year. And so this is us boiling uh, the soybeans and doing a taste test of a nearby um, koji shop, a shop that has been for about 150 years just doing koji in Tokyo. It's the last shop I think that exists in Tokyo that still does it in the traditional way. Um, this is the koji, so it's like mold growing on the rice. And then this is us mixing it in. And then there's the soybeans being crushed and mixed in. And you can't eat miso until six months, over six months fermentation. So it's, it's a really pay it forward kind of food. You know, you can't eat it right away. You can't get the results right away. You have to wait. And the longer you wait, the more medicinal and flavorful it becomes. So that's also like a way of seeing time differently. Now we're so used to getting results on a quarterly basis, which is how Wall Street operates, you know. But it's like, but that's not how we used to have time. Time used to be very slow in our foods, when, especially with fermented things. It takes a long time before you can actually harvest. So those are the miso balls. And one last thing I want to leave with is, um, so I think this is the equivalent to your, like, the office of the parliamentary, uh, what are they called, ministers. So this is our minister building. And one of my friends who's also an anti-nuclear activist, peace activist, who got me into miso, he was like, we need to bring miso into politics. And so he started Earth Day inside parliament. And so once a year, in one of the offices in our minister's building, he does Earth Day. And then he gets a bunch of like massage therapists and hula dancers and all these people you'd normally never see in that kind of environment where it's just like basically men in suits. Um, and they go to any party and tell all the ministers, hey, if you have any time, just come. We'll give you a massage, even for five minutes, and we want you to dip your hands into the miso. And they actually do get politicians come. Um, the last one we did, we had 10 people, including he is now a regular. He was the prime minister when the nuclear disaster happened. Um, and so there's lots of different perspectives on, you know, is he a good guy or a bad guy? But it doesn't matter because, you know, being a politician is a really tough job. You know, like, I mean, nobody likes you. <laughs> right? Like, everybody is complaining to you and it's all over the TV. I mean, it's, I can't imagine what life would be, you know, if you were in national politics, but it would be pretty hard to have personal life. Um, and so it's just a way to connect as humans. Here's a regular resident, here's the former prime minister in the house of counselors mixing <coughs> koji and making miso together. And how human is that? To really see each other as human, to share our microorganisms together. And, and even if nothing changes in politics, at least you get miso at the end, you know? So it's super productive. And I really like how uh, my friend talks about it. He's like, we need to get probiotics into politics because it's such a negative environment, you know? And definitely we have microorganisms in that room, you know, more than before we did miso making. And so this is just for me kind of a revolutionary way to humanize politics, to bring microorganisms into the discussion and do something that's actually really a, a kind of a spiritual and cultural practice. And it kind of started to dawn on me because I've been studying more about Gandhi. Gandhi's charka, the spinning of the wheel. This was like a really important practice, a daily practice for all the Gandhians who are in the ashram, uh, training with Gandhi. And it's also very practical because it's like you're actually making your own clothes and not um, buying your clothes, which is like taking back your power. And so for me in Japan, the miso making is like the charka, and if we can all make miso and really bring each other together in that way, I think it could be a powerful uh, way to challenge a lot of the things that are happening in Japan right now. And so I just want to 
end with, um, before we have a little discussion, uh, Vinoba Bave, who, um, how many of you have heard of Vinoba Bave? Wow, that's pretty hardcore. Oh, really? You published that book? Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, this is, this, this is a revolutionary book. It, it's really transformed my life, and, and the title says it all. But Vinoba's message uh, was to be moved by love. And I think so much of social change now and activism is, is fear-based, which is exactly what marketing does, which is exactly what politics does, is we're always fearing our, each other into doing things. And I think there are times that that's maybe um, appropriate, but if we're always being feared into something, then we don't really have the cognitive ability to see the whole picture and see what's really important right now. And so, for me, I'm trying to shift because in Japan we have this nuclear meltdown that's still continuing. It's going to co continue for a couple decades. Then we have the climate change stuff happening. Then we have us changing the constitution to go to war. I mean, it's, and then Monsanto's coming because they got kicked out of the U.S. You know, it's just like all these problems that just seem so massive and heavy and people are just overwhelmed with their daily life. And so I'm trying to build an activist culture with a lot of my friends, which is really holistic, it's healthy, it's like you want to be in it because you feel good, not because it's right. And that's, I think, that's really when you're being moved by love and you're just like, you know what, I know there's a better world. And that's what I want to be part of. And so that's why I'm taking action, not because I think, you know, we're going to die, or that if we don't do it now, something terrible is going to happen, but to really be like, you know, I don't know if we're going to make it. But it doesn't matter because right now I'm being moved and I just want to make the best, you know, actions and words that I can share to the world right now because I can't help myself but doing it. And so this is kind of, um, yeah, just my experiment and where I'm at and just a few of the examples that's happening in Japan. There's lots of cool things happening as, as in the UK too. And so I just wanted to share that as a cultural exchange. Um, see what comes up, you know, in all of you, um, and yeah, I'll end there because I'm kind of overwhelmed with talking so much. So. <laughs> Thank you.